and try to understand it. Feel it. Feel it. We're going to devote our energies to sports and gardening, all the cultural pursuits as far as they're concerned. In fact, we're going to put the dooms to sleep. Meanwhile, we dig. Greetings and welcome to The Anadromist. This is Burn Power coming to you from Tbilisi, Georgia, somewhere in the Caucasus Mountains, probably nowhere near where you live. But uh, today what we're going to do is we are going to conclude my series on time. And so as a result, I have the feeling this one might be a little longer because it always takes longer to conclude things. We'll see how it goes. Let me summarize where we've been so far. This is the uh, 10th episode in my strange little series on time. And these are personal reflections. Again, I want to say I'm not a scientist. I'm not a philosopher. I am not an academic. I am someone, I do think, obviously, and uh, I'm someone who's been thinking about time seriously since the beginning of the 90s. Uh, before that, I started thinking a little bit about memory. Uh, I discovered Andre Tarkovsky's book, Sculpting in Time, in the late 80s, and that prodded thoughts about the use of memory, especially his chapter on uh, time. Let me uh, summarize what we've done so far, in case you're just happening on this one first. I started off in the early 90s uh, with thoughts about memory and time. And I made these personal discoveries. It seemed that in my early 30s, I was thinking a lot about how I got to where I was, how I got to where I was in New York, why certain things seemed to keep happening over and over in my life, and what could be done to resolve them. Um, and that led to this conclusion, and I remember exactly where and when, uh, you know, when I was uh, in New York City as I was walking down 12th Street, a very important street to me, where I had this sudden thought that, oh my goodness, we live against time. Our whole society is based on the idea that time doesn't matter. Um, so that was the, f the first thing. So... First was my discovery of these things. Then what we saw in our series was that our whole culture does not live as if time matters. In fact, it lives as if time is always the enemy. Time can be an enemy. Uh, you know, if you find you've only got a certain amount of time to live, well, that, that affects you. Uh, traditional societies could be immersed in the, the downsides of time, which is the repetition and, and the enslavement to traditions without being able to challenge it. But we're not in that place today. We are completely in the opposite place. For us, time is something to be conquered in our travel, in our communications, in our entertainment, in our cosmetic surgery, in our medical advances. So often the point is to stop the effects of time. Next, we saw that time has been misunderstood. It is not the clock. A lot of people, as soon as they think of time, they start going tick, 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 the clock. That's not time. That's just the measurement of time. And in fact, that's a visualization of what time actually is. Time is personal, which means it essentially affects everything differently. Next, we saw that uh, there's been a brief history of clocks, of the measurement of time, of schedules. Eventually, you come to things like convenience items, things to help you save time, all based on this misunderstanding of the nature of time. 
We also saw that early science accidentally, and I don't think it was on purpose at all, accidentally left out time in its equations. What I mean is, yeah, they, they figured that something might take so long, and so the measurement of time was really important to them, but what was inside of it was not important, which then led to the dilemma of modern society. So it starts off during what we call the Enlightenment. I always think that's funny as if everyone was getting enlightened. Uh, but they, you know, it was enlightened because suddenly human rationality was important. Well, if human rationality omits the effects of time, human rationality is not very important because it's missing a good chunk of the whole story of how we live. So when the, uh, Enlightenment era scientists began to weigh and measure things. You know, they could weigh and measure water. They could weigh and measure human beings. That was like a shock to people. My goodness, does it matter what you actually weigh? Uh, you could, you know, calculate the distance to stars. You could do all of this stuff. But one thing you couldn't do is weigh and measure God. So God was uh, politely at first put out of, you know, outside the box. Uh, you know, we'll come back to God later. Well, we never did, not in a scientific sense. Uh, next, um, other things that were also these unweighable things began to be questioned. One of them was truth. Not little t truth, although that's been questioned too, but big t truth. Is there truth, you know, or, or other big t, a big uh, capital letter items like like joy or love or peace. Well, love would get, come to eventually Freud is saying, eh, what's love? Maybe it's just libido, the sex drive. Maybe all we are is, uh, you know, these creatures. People will often say that, uh, you know, uh, altruism is enlightened self-interest, these kinds of formulations. Um, all of this to get around the fact that love can't be found in space. <laughs> you know, uh, then there are things like, well, if love can't be found in space, what about meaning? Can meaning be found in space? Is there meaning in my little audio recorder down here? Is there meaning in my computer? I mean, uh, you know, I pick it up and I look at it and I say, like, I don't see it. You know, it's it's just a device. Where does the meaning come from? Well, I see words I typed onto, onto it. Where did those come from? Ah, ah, there's something you can't find in space words. Well, yeah, there they are. They're on my computer. Well, that's just a small fragment of the words that come out of my thoughts. Where are those? Are those just, you know, uh, lab rats pre pressing on pedals to get food and, and have more sex? Is that what our words are? That's been the conclusion of some behaviorists and some uh, very reductionistic thinkers. But we're never satisfied with that. Uh, which brings us to the problems. Science then has no answers to why relationships between people are that important. Um, and so we discover in the next uh, episode of our series on time, we discover that there is a connection between evil and time and love and time. And I'm not going to go into it too far except to say simply this we discover that the real foundation of everything is not matter, not energy and its relationship to matter and all of that stuff, but it's the relationships between everything, which, oh, oh my goodness, that's in the category of time, not space, because everything has a different relationship. And that's what chaos theory shows us. Uh, quantum mechanics shows us these things. But also, we just kind of intuitively know it as well, because we are these creatures that operate in space and time. Um, and the relationship between, to simply put, the relationship between love, love is that which aids relationships. Evil is that which breaks relationships. So those aren't the only definitions of love and evil, but those are their relationships in time. So for most people, the most difficult part, it's interesting that we live in a time where the most difficult part of love for people is not, has not been hooking up. I love that. It's just like, yeah, two things, hooking up. It's like trains. But rather, it's been the commitment. And what is commitment? 
It's the time factor in love. And that's been the most difficult part because I just got to be me. Uh, yeah, well, you can't be me without other people. Good luck. So then we come to this. We saw that time essentially has is a dense web of relationships. And so that everything happens differently, whether on the subatomic level or whether between human beings and the animal world or the geology moving very slowly uh, around us and, and um, or every human, every, everything. It's a web of relationships. So we are inside in a very personal way, not private. Although something, yeah, it's not private. It's personal. That is to say, there's a unique character to our relationships. And we avoid those relationships at our peril. So the question is, how do we get out of, right now we're in this kind of postmodern self-consciousness where I see myself looking at the camera. I could be saying something to myself like, oh my God, what do they think of me? Uh, you know, is my, maybe my hair, should I do something about my hair? Should I, should I shave it? Should I be like all these guys who don't want to deal with their hair when they get older? Or, or, you know, it's my beard. It's got little bits coming out. You know, you start like getting involved. The self-consciousness is crippling. Uh, the fashion industry thrives on it. The cosmetic industry thrives on it. The cosmetic surgery industry thrives on it. Uh, but so does our health uh, industries. You know, I've read somewhere of the, uh, what was it? The, uh, the pain of male, bald, uh, male pattern baldness. The pain of male pattern baldness. You know, I've, I've got some issues up here. And you know what? <laughs> it doesn't cause any pain. The only pain it causes is if you look at yourself too much and you say to yourself, Oh my God, I'm not perfect. I'm not the same as I was when I was 20. Well, that's because you're having problems in time. You're not, you're thinking of yourself. See, if you want to live outside of time, what do you become? A photograph. You know, one of those, the duck face. <laughs> Not that, you don't want to see me doing a duck face, that's for sure. Uh, but, but the point is this. We need to heal those relationships. One of the ways to do it is to start using your memory. There are many problems with the memory. A lot of people think that, uh, that the memory is a, is a problem itself. A lot of people say, I don't really remember much. To which my thought is, yeah, until someone mentions something you don't want to hear then suddenly you remember all too much, you know. Um, memory can be put in in a false way, and the point is to, to get to the truth of our memory, realizing all the falsities and imperfections and limitations our memory has. And finally, the same thing is true of history. History is subject to falsifications. You know, people will say, like, you know... Uh, Memory, history is written by the winners. No, it's not. I'm not a winner. I'm writing history right now. You know, uh, it's, it's not written by anyone in particular. History is a much bigger process. But the point is, though we live in time imperfectly, we must live in time. So, which brings us to where we are today. You know, and this today will be the most practical thing that I probably discuss. And it's essentially how to get to the future, which may sound crazy because all you have to do is wait for it to get there. <laughs> but, but in fact, the future can come to you with openness and choice, or it can come to you fated and destined in the worst possible ways. Um, for instance, parents who do not understand how their children live in time can destroy the future of their children by essentially just, you know, doing things only for themselves. So, and, and that will make the future for the child very difficult. Now, we all live under these circumstances. We all have issues which make the future problematic. We're all going to die. How's that? We're all going to die, and that's the future for all of us. So, I might as well just stop right now. It's pretty bleak. Yeah, but we're all going to die, but... But how do we live until then? How do we acquit ourselves well? And we can acquit ourselves well, and 
we can acquit ourselves badly. People who, one of the things I hate is when, you know, something's going wrong and people will go up to someone and say, it's going to be all right. Is it? <laughs> you know, really? I mean, I mean, there have been a lot of people who died and it wasn't all right. There have been a lot of people who suffered horribly and it wasn't all right. To say, it's going to be okay, it's going to be all right, can be an act of severe cruelty by someone not wishing to get involved with someone else's misery and pain. So, think about that. So, how do you get to the future? And what we're going to talk about is primarily about memory, but how to cultivate your memory. One thing I have learned since I went through this period of trying to understand time and memory is how to use my memory and how, you know, I would say my memory is particularly better than anyone else. I don't have an eidetic memory, a photographic memory. I can't remember everything. Right now I'm trying to learn Georgian. It's tough. It's tough trying to learn Georgian. And I, my memory doesn't just work automatically. You have to make it work. So I wouldn't say, you know, like I'm someone special. Now I do remember a lot, but that's because I have ways and I wouldn't want to call them uh, techniques so much as, as just ways of living. And I certainly am not going to call them hacks. I hate that, you know, like 25 life hacks. Oh, my goodness. Uh, it's just such a bad way of expressing it. Just bad language, bad, bad, cheapened language. So we're going to discuss some ways of, of increasing your memory. Uh, not increasing, just using your memory. You've got plenty of storage capacity, and you're putting stuff in it all the time. The question is what you're putting in it. And uh, so let's discuss that. So one thing, uh, here's an interesting quote. Winston Churchill says, The farther backward you can look, the farther forward you are likely to see. That is absolutely true. That's by Winston Churchill. Also, Andrei Tarkovsky said, History is still not time nor is evolution. Both are consequences. Time is a state. The flame in which there lives the salamander of the human soul. And as we've read of Tarkovsky before, he puts a lot of stock in, in memory. He puts a lot of stock in memory. So, how do you get to your own future? How do you get to an open future? That is to say, a future that, that has possibilities as opposed to the one which doesn't. And believe me, there are lots of people who are living in futures that don't seem very open. And it's not just because of totalitarian uh, dictatorships or something. It's because they are trapped in processes that simply will repeat, eat up their time. And as they get to the future, there's no memory of anything valuable and there is no... No doors that seem to open onto any meaningful process, any meaningful uh, modes of existence. So, first of all, we do have to break out of the postmodern detachment and self-consciousness. And as I mentioned before, the way to do that is through understanding where you are in the process. Now, I've mentioned things like understanding where we are in history, that things like love and peace, these things still matter. But what I'm going to mention now is understanding where you are in your own personal history. So we've talked about the value of memory before. I talked about it in the first episode and I talked about it two episodes ago. But now we are going, and I discussed the, the value of history, but now I'm going to discuss the value of knowing your own personal history. Now, obviously, you can no more know all of your own personal history than you can know all of history in any sense of the word. However, you can know enough to know, for instance, you know presumably what country you were born in, what language you speak. You know vaguely what you look like. I say vaguely because if you think by looking at photographs, you really understand what you look at, you're sorely mistaken. Um, you, you know, for instance, how you did in school. You know, maybe many of the first, you know, think about these things. Tarkovsky says, you know, what's your first memory? What's your first memory of pain? What's your first nightmare? What's your first dream? Uh, what's the first food you remember? That's probably even more difficult. Do you remember the first time that you were in an airplane? Many people don't because they were flying so young, but I do because I didn't fly until I was three years old. 
And I remember, I'm old enough to remember propellers on the plane. <laughs> you know, uh, not quite. Yeah, okay. We're not going to go into how old I actually am. 64, big deal. But uh, the point is this. You have to start locating yourself in your own history. So, and you can't locate yourself in history unless you know a bit about the larger history around you. What's the difference between, say, having been born in the 90s and having been born in the 50s or the 80s or the 70s? What would your life be like being born in those places? What's the difference between being born, for instance, in the 1950s in America being versus being born in the 1990s in Georgia. Now, once you have these kind of parameters and you start to see certain things, then you can start to say, oh, well, I'm this kind of person in a way and not that kind. And now these things don't define you. I, I kind of don't like the talk of silent generation, baby boomers, generation X, uh, millennials, uh, Gen Z or whatever they're going to call it. I don't like that because people, it's valuable in one sense of saying like, okay, I'm with all these other people, but it's not valuable in another. I, I have never identified with the baby boomers, although a, a lot of what I, I'm saying now, someone may say, okay, boomer, which is like a put down. It's not just a put down for people my age, but a put down for anyone older than say 30. Uh, PewDiePie does this stuff these days where he did a whole uh, takeoff of, of, People saying, okay, boomer, uh, through memes. And, you know, he, he says, like, I, you know, he's just turned 30. He says, I'm, I'm afraid I'm a boomer now. Well, of course, to which the reply is, okay, zoomer, which is the Gen Z types. But no, I don't ever feel connected to the baby boomers in that sort of way. In the sense that I didn't do sex, drugs, and rock and roll. I mean, yeah, I went to rock and roll concerts, but I was never like, yeah, rock and roll. I was never one of those people. You know, uh, I, I was never, uh, you know, and as time went on, I, cause I'm kind of on the cusp of the punk rock generation as well, which to me is a more valid way of talking about it rather than these uh, baby boomer things. I'd rather say, were you a hippie? Were you not? Were you a punk rocker? Were you not? You know, did you dress like Madonna? Did you not? You know, those things tell me much more. Did you listen to, was Nirvana like the most important thing to you or not? you know, Michael Jackson or not. And if a person says, yeah, Michael Jackson, yes, Nirvana, no, I go like, okay, well, we're, we know something about you then. Whereas just saying, you know, X or millennial or whatever doesn't tell you that much. Um, anyway, where, where was I? I was, I was somewhere in time right here. <laughs> um, but the point is this, is that being, uh, finding yourself in time is important. Uh, for instance, knowing that you went through a certain period of time. I remember the first time I met someone born in, I'm born in 1955. They were born in 1968. And I realized this person has no conception of what happened in the 1960s. That is to say, it's all books to them. They don't know at all. And you can put it to yourself uh, this way. Um, if you were born in, say, 1991... You remember September 11th, 2001, but if you were born in 1999, you don't because you're too young. It doesn't mean much. It's all books to you. So a person born after, say, I don't know, the 1995 or so has very little consciousness of uh, September 11th. So their world is very different. They don't understand why, why people are, you know, kind of leery about Islamic terrorists. You know, they, because they were born before that, you know, and, and, uh, to them, it was just normal, the state of paranorm, paranoia that people were in and they want to get out of it. So also we remember from last time we were discussing the fallacy of believing in any, any idea of the right side of history. Um, uh, we, we need to take a humbler view of our own his, personal history. We're not part of great movements. We're not doing great things. Uh, we can't be whatever we want to be. These are all part of the delusions of our, our contemporary world. But a humbler sense of our personal history is more aligned with uh, Jordan Peterson's rule number four in his 12 Rules for Life. Compare yourself to who you were yesterday, not to who someone else is today. 
I think if more people understood that, they would stop uh, idolizing celebrities. And because there is no point of idolizing or being a fan of any celebrity, a fan being short for fanatic, unquestioned loyalty. So how do you do that? How do you understand your own memory? How do you assemble a sense of your personal history? Well, first of all, you have to understand a bit more about how memory works. Now, there is no one way to remember things. So I write uh, in a journal. Um, someone else could paint. Uh, someone else might remember through talking. Uh, in fact, many of us do, talking and sharing with people. Um, could be the placement of objects in a room. You know, I, you know, the, this thing reminds you of something. Um, there are so many ways of trying to, of, of holding on to our memories. Things that remind us of things. For instance, you know, yearly uh, meals uh, during, say, Christmas time. Or, you know, marking the passage as I do very much of my birthday and New Year's Day. I don't mark them necessarily in big celebrations as much as I just simply mark them by writing about where I am now at that point. But there are many ways to attempt to forget. And I say attempt to forget. Uh, for instance, endless, endless, endless video watching is a great way to attempt to erase your memories because what you're doing is you're, you're substituting your memories for the, these images. You know, and I'm not saying not to watch these things, but these days, you know, it's like, I have no, no problem with someone playing of video games. I have a problem with people who spend thousands upon thousands and upon thousands of hours playing video games. And the reason is, is because what are you doing? I mean, you're creating blanknesses in your memory that is only filled by media imagery. So your own sense of personal history is now replaced by media. That's a very strange thing that we do in our modern world. So whether, you know, could have been through television, you know, someone who was, say, of the generation before me, which is sometimes called the silent generation, my mother's generation, um, they would simply come home from a hard day of work and veg in front of television. Now, they didn't have all the options that we do today of the options of, you know, choosing your own media. You could just watch YouTube. You could watch, you know, binge watch uh, several different, uh, you know, television shows. You can do all sorts of stuff to fill up the void, uh, to, to prevent yourself from thinking at all about yourself. Uh, but that's how they did it. They would binge, they would just simply veg out in front of a television set. Today, our options seem much, much broader. Uh, and just living today seems to, you know, this life on the phone seems to fill up the, uh, your, your brain with nothing. It's like mental cholesterol, uh, memory cholesterol, just hardening the ar arteries. We do need a bit of cholesterol. As part, of, it isn't a bad thing, but if you get too much, it clogs you up, and there you are. Um, so the question is how to put things into your memory. What to put in? Well, what you should be putting in is relationships to things, and that can be relationships to animals, relationships to land. For instance, it, it you know just having a garden is an absolutely amazing way. To, to remember things, because you suddenly become attuned to the seasons, the touch of the soil. Uh, am I saying there's a value to things that are, are physical over uh, media? Absolutely. But that's not to say reading a book isn't important. That's not to say watching a movie isn't important. That's not to say looking at art isn't important. All these things are really important. And they can all be used as an aid to memories. Or they can all be used as a substitute. So, here's how I put things into my memory. You might find a different way to do it. But, for instance, I do own a lot of physical media. Um, I have, you know, a big library of books, a big library of albums, a big library of movies. 
And when I say big, it's probably bigger than yours. So, uh, but I don't just put things randomly on shelves. Uh, how I put things on shelves is how I remember. Does this sound strange? So if I buy a record album, if I put it on the shelf with my thousands of other albums, I don't put it alphabetically. That would be, the, the, there are a few places where the alphabet works, but that's because there's so many in one uh, time period, one style, that you need finally to use the alphabet. So what I do is I divide things by country, by chronologically by style, what style came first. So in America, you know, I would have my jazz records before my rock records and my, my rock and roll from the 50s before my rock from the 60s. Um, and I can't put it in without knowing what it is. So by doing so, it keeps everything alive. And that's how I do everything in my memory. If I watch a movie, uh, I'm thinking to myself, uh, you know, okay, I just watched the movie Animal House again for some reason. And I think to myself, what does this say about comedy? What's well, a very important comedy uh, in relationship to uh, the history of comedy? But it's even more important in the relationship of movies to uh, education in America, high school and college movies. Uh, I think about the use of music in it, why the use of the song Louie Louie was important, or uh, John Belushi's uh, breaking of the guitar when the guy starts singing a folky song, uh, I Gave My Love a Cherry, or something like that. So that, that I start thinking of these relationships. What do these things mean? Of course, I think about comedy and the history of comedy, about John Belushi's death and all of this. All of this from just, and I'm just going off on that one little movie. It came to my mind. I wasn't thinking about it. But it then relates to all these other, for instance, so then I think about why was there an antipathy to Louie Louie, the song by the Kingsmen, which is probably one of the greatest garage rock songs of all time, versus the Folkies. What does that mean? What does that say since the, the, the movie was set in the 1960s? Suddenly it opens up this whole idea of what the 1960s was like. Um, well, that's how I remember everything, is that nothing goes in without being put somewhere on the shelf, in the sense that shelf out there represents the shelf up here. So that everything has, what I've done is I've physically replicated what goes on in my mind. And that's one way I remember. That's how I can remember an awful lot. So, you know, I can remember how I got involved with puppetry. I can remember, you know, one of the biggest mysteries to me is how I came to Georgia. And the reason it's a mystery is because it doesn't seem to have happened as a result of any outside um, influence. And that's rare because normally... Uh, for instance, I have, you know, friends in New York and I can say, oh, I met that friend through that friend through that friend. I go back these webs of relationships. And I find that fascinating to ask, how did you get to know somebody? You know, don't just save that for, you know, an accidental conversation. Think about it. How did you get to where you are right now? Uh, how did I get to Georgia? Well, I'll tell you the fact, coming to Georgia was a completely open choice for me. It has nothing to do with my ancestry, has nothing to do with, uh, for instance, uh, coming here because I thought there would be work here, has nothing to do with escaping America, has nothing to do with anything. Well, it does have something to do with music, and it has something to do with dance. And in 19, uh, sorry, in 2012, I started becoming interested in Georgia because of the music. I had already had one Georgian uh, album on my shelf. I appreciated the Georgian music, but I didn't, uh, somehow it didn't spark anything that made me say, huh, what's this Georgia thing? Part of it was, it was in the Soviet Union then. I, I was ever going to go to the Soviet Union when the record came out in the 1980s. So, you know, and, and, but, 
But the fact that I spent the time thinking about music opened the door that one day I would open this, this Georgian door. Had I never thought about music, I would not be here. Now, if any one of my friends in Alaska gets interested in Georgia, they have a really good reason why. Me. They, I'm sure they talk to me about it, and then, that's interesting, Burn. Maybe I'll come visit you one day. That kind of thing. Memory functions a lot like Top 30 Radio used to function. And maybe in some places still does. What do I mean? Well, in Top 30 Radio, you have these, like, okay, you've got 30 songs, with the number one song being the song that's supposedly the most popular right now. And when I was growing up, that was KFRC. I listened to mostly as a kid. And it was a fantastic little AM radio station that played all sorts of music. You could hear, you know, the Rolling Stones and Frank Sinatra and Hank Williams on the same channel. Not all the time, but they were there. They, they played a lot of different kinds of music. You would hear a song that crossed over from country into rock, into pop. Um, there was a wider variety of music on that channel than there is in most narrow casting today. So, uh, but I remember, you know, there were the songs that climbed up to number one, and we would call it, hey, you know, can you play Jimi Hendrix's Purple Haze again? Uh, there were the songs that, you know, kind of tried to get to number one, didn't make it, bubbled up. There were the songs when they first came on the radio. Uh, you'd hear them once or twice. Some of those songs really caught me, and then they disappeared. And uh, that's always been an interesting thing for me, how that works. How it works that I still remember songs like that. Um, and we'll come to that in just a second. But, so so essentially things happen like this. The things that just bubble up in the, the old radio uh, charts and such would be things you'd hear just a little bit, and then they would disappear. And then there would be the things like, Hey Jude, I never want to hear again in my life because they played it endlessly in 1968. And there was like a battle of the bands where it won, you know, they, it's like, like, Hey Jude versus this song, you know, uh, and, and it won like 30 times in a row. And I heard it over and over. If I never hear Hey Jude again in my life, I will be so happy. Uh, but that's what would happen. And so you would hear these hits over and over. That's often a lot of times. What, like, I'm walking through uh, Tbilisi, Georgia. You see, like, some kids with uh, electric guitar and, a, you know, on the street singing an American song. What are they singing? They're singing Imagine by John Lennon. They're singing, you know, uh, Wish You Were Here, uh, Pink Floyd. They're singing Hallelujah, the Jeff Buckley or Leonard Cohen song. And I'm sick of those <laughs> because I've heard them so often. And it's like I passed one girl. She was singing a song by Mazzy Starr. I immediately threw her money and I said, thank you for singing something with just a bit of research to it. Anyway, that I don't want to get off on that. But um, but no, so that's how it would be. The, 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 there would be the big things that you hear over and over and over. And then the these things would eventually fall off. And you wouldn't hear them for a while. So, you know, mercifully, we didn't hear Hey Jude for another year or so after that. And then you start to hear it again as an oldie. It would disappear for a while and come back as an oldie. That's how our memory works. Things bubble up. And when you first hear of something, you don't really comprehend it yet. It's something, you know, like when I first heard Georgian language, I didn't comprehend it at all. I couldn't take it in. It just sounded like someone switching the uh, dial on a radio station. Goes, oh, oh, you know, it's just like I couldn't make heads or tails of the word. Eventually, some of those words, you know, uh, some of the things, well, words too, get up here. And then they, they, some stay up there for a long time. Some fall off. You are often, for instance, you're in, uh, you can see it in your own life. If you've had or know about this kind of experience, uh, you're in high school. Later, you're in college. Well, those high school and college are like the big hits. And then they're the things that bubble up underneath them. But eventually, college disappears. And then one day, maybe you meet someone you love. And so there's this whole period going up to getting married. Well, at least traditionally. Now people live with each other and then marriage is kind of like a ho-hum and then we get divorced. Uh, we don't want to go there. It's sad to me that, that you know, marriage is often has nothing to do with a courtship. Because then you get to the wedding and then 
all that before goes back to the, to the disappears into the uh, that blank space before it comes back as an oldie. Um, and and in fact, some things really don't come back very well. They 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 disappear into the memory, and then maybe well try this. This is mysterious. The other day. For no discernible reason. You know, I'm doing something around the house. Cleaning. I think I was taking off a light bulb. And this weird jingle from the Montgomery Ward store came back into my head. It was a jingle I had not heard uh, for... Now, I wasn't doing anything that reminded me of it. But it was a jingle I had not heard for over, I figured, 45 years suddenly came into my head and I started singing this thing and I said to myself, that is really weird. Now, I would like to say I can sing it for you right now, but something weird happened. I then remembered another Montgomery Ward jingle and that one goes like this. Your money goes farther at Montgomery Ward. Ooh. That one also I hadn't heard for a long, long time. But it washed out the other one. <laughs> and I cannot, for the life of me, remember the other one. Not that I want to. I don't want to remember this one. <laughs> but somehow, that says something about the craft of jingle writing, of sticking earworms into your head that they can come back later, that people know how to craft music in such a way as to be insidious like that. But that's for our musical discussions. But the point is this. What is trapped inside of your memory? Do you understand what I just said to you? A, a 30 second jingle from 45 years ago that I have literally not had one thought about in 45 years came back into my head. What else is buried there? Now, if I really, 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 really wanted to try to drag that up, I probably could. But the point is this, so much is locked inside your memory. Now, we do need aids, uh, there are aids to help our memory. And what does an aid to the memory do, do? It doesn't really substitute for the memory as much as it something to bring things back. So, for instance, a certain object in your house might be on a shelf, and whenever you look at it, you remember where you were when you bought it. And if you really look at it, you can remember a lot more circumstances around that object. Well, of course, one of the best aids to the memory is the are journals and diaries. Now, interestingly enough, the word journal, diary and journal essentially mean exactly the same thing. Uh, the word diary comes from the Latin diarum, which, and the word journal comes from the word French, which means jour, and both of them mean the word day. So it's a daily record. Now, diaries are no miracle cure. Some people use diaries just to write what they're feeling every day. Other people uh, write down more events that happen. I've kind of gotten to the point, I don't write a daily diary anymore. Uh, but I do write whenever, whenever it strikes me to write. Uh, I do write uh, kind of like the tone of something. An event that happens, uh, meeting someone that that you know uh, that struck me as an interesting uh, moment in my life. What I also do though is I have a, the same digital recorder that I'm recording the sound on this for. Yes, I am recording. Uh, I will often use that for uh, talking to myself and and doing what I used to do more in journal writing. So I use a combination of things. Now. These are no miracle cure. They don't immediately make you remember everything. In fact, I've often looked at it and go like, huh, that's interesting that I did that. Because <laughs> I don't really remember it too much in depth. And, 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 but it's interesting. Sometimes I'll, I'll look and I'll see I wrote something that I don't remember. Then I'll look at it and go like, oh, yeah, now I remember that. Which means, like that weird little uh, advertisement jingle, it's still in your head. You know, do you understand what I'm saying? This stuff is still in your head, whether you think you remember it or not. Uh, if you were conscious, you'd probably remember it. Um, but uh, one of the big faults that people have about journal writing is that they, uh, 
they tend to uh, beat themselves up if they're not regular. My feeling is, yeah, just just go ahead and keep adding. I've never been particularly regular. I, sometimes I, I go through periods where I write more and other times less. And I have, I don't know, two yards worth, two meters worth of uh, journals that I've accumulated about myself over the years. Hmm. Well, that's interesting. Um, there are many different kinds of written records, though, besides journals. There are calendars. I have had one friend who would just mark things on calendars. You know, it's just like, or, or nature journals, where you just mark, today the sun did this. Uh, you know, I saw, or, you know, I saw a blue jay at the window. Uh, you know, this was the first time we saw the hooligan fish swimming up. You know, all these different kinds of things you can notate. Um, there's scrapbooks, you know, and I think scrapbooks are, are an interesting thing. But, and here's where I'm going to be very negative about certain things. But, avoid scrapbooking. Do you, do you hear what I just said there? Scrapbooking is a verb. But more than that, scrapbooking is an industry. And uh, for that matter, I wonder about journaling. You may notice that I write journals. I don't journal. I don't understand why people journal. Uh, it, because journaling to me is like scrapbooking. It sounds like something that's part of an industry. Writing a journal may sound clunky, but I'd rather write. You know, and uh, yeah, so I, I, there are these kind of neologisms that make me, make my flesh crawl. Journaling and scrapbooking are two of them. If you journal or scrapbook, please forgive me. I just can't cross that divide. Um, I read too many other books. <laughs> you know, for me, writing is important. And, uh, and, and it, so there. Uh, photo albums are important. Yeah, what happened to photo albums? Photo albums got uh, put into the same category as uh, analog watches. <laughs> but analog watches are nice. Yeah, once upon a time, there was just a watch. Then digital watches came along. And then someone started using this clunky phrase, the analog watch. Just like there's a, you know, there used to be a regular guitar, then there was an electric guitar, then the other one became the acoustic guitar. Um, but the truth is, the way we collect photos and take photos today is appalling. Uh, we take too many photos. We don't have a way of showing them to people. Facebook is terrible. Instagram, all these things are terrible because they, I mean, I put stuff on there. But I know that in many cases, this stuff just disappears. It's like, I show up to someone, it's like, eh. well, it's like really, really, really bad radio because it just lasts for a day or two. You know, it's not like people can go by and, and keep looking and, and appreciating anything. Um, I do put out, al interestingly enough, I put albums of, say, the dancers at the Georgian uh, Music and Dance Ensemble, Erisioni. I put them on there. And people keep going back to those. But that's because Georgians tend to look at those kinds of albums in a very different way than other people do. I almost never have my friends from America or Western Europe going back into my Erisioni albums. It's always Georgians. And I think that's interesting. They use it really like a photo album. So it can be done online, but it's, it's more difficult um, but, but for me, I think what one can do is print the best photos that one takes, put them into an album. Another solution to this dilemma is to take your, the best of your uh, photo files and put them into a book and have some, there are these different companies, uh, that will make them into a nice little book, not too much money that you can then just show to people from time to time. So. However, now, I want to warn against insane documentation processes. And what I mean, for instance, scrapbooking can get way out of hand, you know, of saving every detail of something. Uh, journaling can get out of hand. And sometimes I think myself, I've used uh, uh, writing in a journal as a uh, almost a magical process. You think if you write it, it will happen. When I was younger, I used to think if I wrote about a certain girl that she would fall in love with me. Uh, I was quite deceived. But that, that thing hung around in my head for quite a while. Um, you know, it was just this, these, we can write these things like down. This is why I, I'm more 
uh, troubled by people who just write their feelings down and their poems. I mean, this is what like all sorts of, you know, younger uh, adolescents do. And I did a certain amount of this. But interestingly enough, when I look back at my earliest journals, I was writing people's names and places and events. Oh my, I am so happy I did that. That my life was interesting enough that it wasn't just all me. And in fact, I had all these really bad journals that unfortunately I threw away. I wish I had kept them. Uh, where it was my fantasy life in the sense of if if I met this girl in high school or whatever, what would she think of me? Fortunately, I I, I, I would have found that really fascinating, not because the, the information in it was interesting, but it would tell me something about my psychological defects as a person. So there was this guy named Robert Shields who lived in Washington State who recorded everything. He literally recorded every five minutes of his day. Now, he didn't do it every five minutes of his day, but he would write down what he, well, sometimes he did. He would write down. So, so this guy would note things like this. He would write, note his body temperature, his blood pressure, his medications. He described his urinary and bowel movements. Uh, he slept only two hours at a time so he could record his dreams. He had a thing called hypergraphia. Um, here's a, I have to read these. This is the extreme of what you don't want to do. You don't want, you know, this is why people don't do journals well. If you start doing this kind of stuff, you're in trouble. Stop. And, uh, let's see, July 25th, 1993, 7 a.m. I cleaned out the tub and scraped my feet with my fingernails to remove layers of dead, dead skin. <laughs> okay, I'm going to try to make it through here. Um... 7.05, five minutes later, passed a large firm stool and a pint of urine, used five sheets of paper. <laughs> I don't know if I can go any further. I'm going to try, though. April. <laughs> okay. April 18th, 1994. Uh, 6.30 to 6.35. I put in the oven two Stouffer's macaroni and cheese at 350 degrees. Um, <laughs> this is a good one. 635 to uh, 650, I was at the keyboard of an IBM wheel writer making entries in the diary. 650 to 730, I ate Stouffer's macaroni and cheese and Cornelia uh, at... Um, and Cornelia, I guess that's his wife, ate the other. Grace, I'm assuming it's, he's a daughter. I'm amazing, amazed he had time for a daughter. Uh, d decided she didn't want one. Um, 7.30 to 7.35, we changed the light over the back stoop since the bulb had burned out. August 13th, 1995. <laughs> okay, 18, 8.45 in the morning. I shaved twice with the Gillette sensor blade and shaved my neck behind both ears and crossways on my cheeks, too. <laughs> okay, so I'm not telling you to do that, but I thought that was interesting that you can go really, really, really crazy. So photos themselves are a good way of remembering things, but we have far too many photos today, as I, as I mentioned. Um, I do not understand a parent you know, having 3,000 photos of their child in the, at the age of three. You know, it's just, uh, you can do that. People do that all the time. But they're, I mean, I, I, I just know people who, who've done that. They've just taken thousands of photos of their children. And I wonder what kind of effect that's going to have on the children. Uh, like I, I've said before, I think I've got about 20 photos before the age of eight or so. I'm happy with those. I don't want another... 3,000. You know, I want those to just be me growing up, not me looking at myself growing up. Again, it creates the the self, uh, self-consciousness, the postmodern self-consciousness. So, so in other words, it's created without having any postmodern philosophy. You don't know anything about Derrida or Lacan or anybody. You Instead, it is through the technology that we've created our detachment. Uh, books. Simply reading is important. 
and remembering what books you read, because often that'll tell you something. And in a way, I think that's deeper than what movies can do. Movies only take two hours or so of your life. But a book is like living, it, you spend time, you, you ruminate over the words. Uh, right now I'm reading this book uh, by a, a Dutch uh, mystery writer. Uh, let's see if I can remember his name. Jan Willem uh, Van de Veteran. And um, I think I said that right. And, um, but, but what's interesting is that as I'm reading it, you know, I'm putting everything I know about Dutch people in Netherlands. I've been there uh, once, as well as, as and I know I've known several Dutch people in my life. I find them interesting. But but I'm learning. I learned so much about the culture just through the way this guy writes. Uh, just a certain kind of sense of humor that the Dutch people have. That's very different than the American sense of humor, or the British, or French, or anybody else. So, but but it, 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 you know, it's uh, reading is not a cure all. You can read crap. You can read too much, like anything else. But with all human endeavors, we are subject to insanely addictive behaviors. And that's what I'm not trying to encourage. I'm trying to encourage because it's the addictive behaviors that cause you to lose the memory of time. And you find your place in it. Objects are important, too. Uh, Obviously, in one's house, there are objects that one picks up on one's journey through life, and these can have different purposes. Uh, you know, they're thought pieces, mementos, things found in the forest while walking, you know, you find a little shell on the beach, something you find at a, at a yard sale somewhere, uh, trophies, certificates on the wall and such, but, 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 but. Like many of these, there are vulture-like industries hovering around these and feed upon every human trait. So my recommendation, do not buy things marketed as souvenirs, ever. Why? These are empty things. Unless, I mean, unless you really, really, really connect to it, these are empty. So little spoons marking where you've been. Uh, Little that have the name of places, you know, the, you go to different countries and they have little Eiffel Towers and little uh, Empire State Buildings and, and or, you know, I Heart New York bumper stickers or, you know, uh, endless, uh, the stuff that they sell as part of the tourist camp, t-shirts. I'm not a big fan of, of t-shirts with anything on them, uh, forgive me. Um, but, you know, little cups, T-shirts, special limited edition things, ad nauseum. These things are endless, and they, they sucker you in. And here's what happens to those things. You take them home, you look at them a little bit, maybe you put one of them on a shelf, but most of them you'll put off in a little drawer somewhere or put into a box, and you'll never see them again. And then when you die, someone has to, as I had to with my mother's possessions, go through and find the junk that she had collected from these places that meant nothing. That's the operative word. These mean nothing. You shouldn't have things that don't mean anything uh, or things that have such a limited meaning uh, that, that, you know, and I know people get involved with collecting very strange, strange things. There was a guy I knew who in high school who just collected beer cans. And I can see this getting out of hand really quickly because eventually they started making beer cans just to sell to people like that. But nevertheless, objects are a great way to remember things. Now, I, like I say, I collect a lot. Of, for instance, I have collected a lot of musical albums. These do several things for me. One is that I it's the hunt. <laughs> it's funny. Uh, it's the hunt that's very important for these things. Where you were when you bought it. Anyone who's a serious record or book collector or, you know, who, who is involved with any sort of object that for some reason they feel really attracted to, they're attracted to, will not only tell you about uh, the object itself and what it means within the context of its history, but they will tell you where they were when they found it. That's important. That's the moment. That's the thing worth collecting right there, is the, that experience of, of interacting with the world, in a sense. Um, so for me, I mean, if, I've often uh, kind of 
had people over at my house and occasionally I'll meet someone who gets interested in my record collection and I'll say like, well, pull out any record and I'll tell you where I bought it or tell you how I got it. Um, which is kind of impressive since there are quite a few thousand of them. <laughs> but that tells me about my history. That's why it's important. Oh, this is what I wanted to say. So I just recently, uh, put out, uh, a kind of re-shared my 12 true albums of Christmas. And I put it with this one uh, page on Facebook. And this guy immediately went through and found it all on Spotify, except for about four albums he couldn't find. Found it on Spotify and said, here you are, everybody. And I was like, okay, how sad. You don't understand. The point was... Not simply, here's the music. The point was, I want you to go out and find it. And I just thought about this again this morning, and I thought about how sad it was that that happened. That, uh, and, and how people today have turned all of their recorded musical experiences into strange little streaming files. And so that there's nothing, there's no weight to it. It just is background music. It becomes part of our soundtrack for our lives. But that's not what music is. Music's not our soundtrack. This is why I really dislike this experience. Uh, back in the 1980s, briefly, I borrowed a friend's Walkman and walked around. Walkman, that ages me. Walked around listening to things. Music I had made on cassette. Listening and looking at everything. And I immediately said, yeah, it changes everything. It makes... Like these, these ugly streets, it makes them heroic, you know, and they're not, you know, and it, instead of dealing with what's in front of me, listening to the sounds of the environment around me, I'm in my own little movie, but I'm not in my own little movie. And again, we're back to the self-consciousness thing. So for me, looking for a book on a special topic is, is a vital interest. And it's not about just getting it on Kindle and having, you know, I know people who tell me, like, I've got 300 books on Kindle that I'm waiting to read. And I was just like, it doesn't mean anything. You need to go look for the book. You need to put effort into it. You need to think, why should I read this? You need to ask yourself those questions. And that's precisely what all these streaming and downloading services don't allow you to do. Uh, or they allow you to have so much and yet you, you can't, you don't know what to read, really. If you've got 300 books, what do you read next? You need to be guided by what is important for you to read next. And um, it's the same with art. It's the same with, uh, you know, or, I mean, for instance, traveling. Buying art books is a great way to remember places rather than uh, buying souvenirs. Because, you know, if you, if you understand anything of the art of a country, you really understand where you've been. Um, use buying, you know, and going back to the subject of traveling, what do you buy? Well, how about food products? Of course, they're usually used up within a few weeks or years, but that's not bad. Uh, you get, uh, sometimes you get a flavor that you say, gee, I'd like to go back to that country to try that again. But also, if you have a, a certain food that you like that you brought home, a can or a, a container of, saving the container then becomes interesting. I have very interesting little cans. When I find a memorable can, I save that. Uh, you know, most cans disappear, but every now and then, one can will strike, strike me as an interesting one or one uh, box or something like that. Not, I don't go crazy about that stuff. And I have seen people who have, like the beer bottle collector, uh, you know, now maybe there's a reason why you should collect those things. And I'm not saying collecting beer cans or something is, is bad. However, I do notice that they make stuff, especially for people who collect beer cans, hmm. which means there's another vulture industry feeding off of you. So, and, and going to a flea market in another country is another way to find something memorable. Um, and remember, someday you're going to be dead. Again, there's the future. Someday you're going to be dead. And if all you have are little trinkets that you've picked up that don't mean anything, 
and this is what you want to pass on as objects in the world, it's, it's not a good legacy. It's, it's sad, really. And I would suggest that, you know, my, my feeling is when I die, people aren't going to look at my stuff and say, like, oh, look at all this stuff. They're going to find meaning in what I've collected because they're going to say, my God, this was a library. This was someone who really thought about something. That's how we should live in the world. That even what we pass on in death means something to the people beyond us, which sounds like totally like obvious. And yet, look at what we actually buy and collect. Um, you know, it just doesn't have that kind of weight. And we are also subject to the, the vulture industries that are, are picking over our bones. Um, so, another way to remember things is events. Use events to mark your time, uh, including sad and bad events. If something bad happens, write it down or make a painting of it or write a song about it. Commemorate those things. Not to commemorate it, you know, I wouldn't write about a bad event in order to get revenge because that's not good. And in fact, we'll talk about that more importantly in a moment. But, uh, but obviously, things like births and marriages are used to mark the passing of time. You know, uh, these, these make our life meaningful to say, do you remember when a good friend got married or, or the, your son or daughter was married? Um, watch out for the highly commercialized leech industries, though, that surround these. Uh, uh, death, ah, man, death is too important to allow to be turned into yet one more unmemorable thing. I mean, I have been to funeral services that make me just, ah, they're cringeworthy in every sense of the word. Uh, you know, it's just, it's, it's all prepackaged. It's not meaningful because people don't live in communities anymore. They live in these kind of nameless suburbs where there are nameless industries that feed off of your memories, feed off of commemorations. And the same is certainly, certainly true for weddings. I mean, there are whole industries within the wedding cycle that are just, you know. So, of course, then there's the other problem is that people want to make their wedding so unique. And there are all these people making their wedding so unique that none of them are unique because they all feel like these, like, tossed off affairs that, uh, don't get me started. I've often thought I would be uh, very happy if I could just encourage people to find ways of making true, non-commercialized uh, celebrations of weddings and funerals. Um, and I do have ideas on how these things happen. But the truth is we live in times where we are subject to these industries. Industries that feed on your memories and make them into something slightly less than memorable. Um, so... Let's see. So we got deaths, marriages. Also, though, moving is important. And it's important not just to move, but to, to commemorate it in some way. Whether it's having a great dinner once you've moved all your stuff. Or whether it's inviting all your friends over to help. Uh, but also writing about it, taking photos of it, these kinds of things. Catastrophes are important. Yeah, it's bad. But this is important to remember. You know, and what I am saying is, don't forget the dark stuff. Don't just remember the happy stuff. I don't care what people say. It's really important. Major illnesses, same thing. It's important to remember those times and not to put them in the, I don't want to remember the bad stuff category. That's, that's terrible. You need to remember bad things. Um, friendships, old and new, need to be celebrated and commemorated. Uh, the, the important moments in that, or when you've lost a friend, you need to remember those things. Um, and what about the first time you read a certain book or saw a certain film? Uh, for, for some people, though, those are very important. And I can remember, for instance, uh, the first time I saw Andrei Tarkovsky's uh, Andrei Rublev. I was watching at the New York's uh, Thalia Theater. And that was at 96th Street. I walked until 42nd Street, my brain exploding with ideas before I finally 
went to a, a, a pay phone and called someone up and said, I've got to tell you about this film I just saw. You see, I've got all of this connected to just the first time I saw the film. Um, you know, and why do people make top 10 lists? That's a really good question because I think it is important to make lists of things. Now you can go crazy with it and people have gone crazy with lists and there are YouTube channels that are dedicated to nothing but list insanity. And again, lists like everything else, there's an industry feeding on your memories, feeding on your, your likes and dislikes. But uh, there is a certain kind of healthy making of lists. Why do you think we have 10 commandments? Why not 11? I'm sure that we could have found an 11. You know, you know, how come thou shalt not lie didn't make it into the Ten Commandments? I don't know. Ten just sounds better. <laughs> but it's good because it, it distills things. It helps you to understand things a little better and to understand your own choices and memories. Uh, so how do we commemorate things? Well, it's up to us, obviously. Each person does it differently. From a simple mark on a calendar to a you know, decision of having a feast. I would often do things around Christmas time. Uh, I, you know, for me, it was very important that we sing Christmas carols together. No commercialized Christmas carols. You know, uh, that, that there be meat as a central, uh, point. And I'd often make it a meat we didn't normally have. So not even turkey. Turkey in America, it's too common. So goose, you know, um, but I, but I've had other meals where it was like, you know, the, the one that you know, I had seal meat one night. <laughs> and seal is like a really strange, someone, a friend of mine, the Nixons, used to teach out in a small little uh, village, Shafornak, out in uh, the uh, western Alaska in the middle of nowhere. I think they were with, uh, it was kind of Eskimo people. It was the, what was it? Uh, it wasn't a, uh, a Yupix. I think it was a Yupix. But anyway, the, um, you know, they, as, you know, European uh, white American types, were not allowed to hunt uh, for uh, seal, but the, but the natives could. And so they got, were given seal meat, and they froze it and brought it to me in, some, in uh, Haines, which is a thousand miles away from, <laughs> literally a thousand miles away from uh, Shafornak. And uh, I was able to cook it for friends. And it was, I, I realized it was a very strong meat. What did it taste like? Something between cross between fish and goat? <laughs> fish and bear? I don't know. Very strange taste. So I cooked it, uh, uh, pressure cooked it as a barbecue with barbecue sauce just to try to hide the flavor. Uh, but oh boy, that was memorable. And thank you, uh, Mixons, if you ever watch this. Um, and that's what's important, is doing things that are memorable. And, and I, I could just tell you, having seal meat at one dinner in my life was a memorable thing. That's what you should think about. When you make things, when you do things, make them memorable. Don't do the same things all the time, although sometimes, uh, you know, a yearly tradition or something is good. But the more you repeat things the more unmemorable things become, the more you are dislocated from time. And so practically, if you really want to commemorate something, do something that is unique and memorable. Um, but don't get addicted to the new. And that's the other side of the equation. People who have to travel. I was just, uh, you know, uh, looking at someone's video who's been to every country on earth. And after a while, the guy is just like ending up in these places back and forth. I'm going like, why are you doing this? Why, what are you chasing? Because you really don't know a thing till you stay there a while. You can't just show up for, you know, sp spend a week in Burundi. You know, it's like, what does that mean? What does that accomplish? You don't really connect. Uh, you can make a nice video of it, I suppose. Spending a couple of weeks in some uh, exotic, strange, foreign little country. And, and yeah, I learned something from it, but... And that's there is an addiction to the new, and that's a problem as well. And that's also just as damaging to us as a repetition of things over and over, particularly media. Uh, so understand your society's history, as we discussed last time. Put yourself in it. Where are you? Reevaluate your relationship to the clock. Limit technology 
as a mediator to the degree you can. Now, we can't. As Jacques Ellul says, we are living in the technological milieu. We are living in this environment of technology. We are no longer living in nature. We're not going back to nature anytime soon. We are living in, uh, we are no longer living simply in human society. We are living in technology. However, we can uh, put, you know, you can choose to take a walk without your phone. You can choose to not listen to something as you're walking around. And even if you're just listening to traffic sounds in the city, you can, you can do that and say, why does this disturb me so? And you can ask questions. And you can maybe try to find answers to those questions. You can't find answers if you're hiding from it. So learn to do things, uh, limit your technology as a mediator to the degree you can, and especially the uh, limit the degrees of mediation between you and other people. Um, and that's difficult. Here I am talking on YouTube saying this, but there's something more personal about this, at least one way, than there is uh, just simply being on random in kind of random chat rooms and stuff. And I have made interesting connections through doing this. One of the good things is at this moment, I don't have thousands of, uh, of followers and viewers. So that's fine. Maybe someday that will end. And, and then, uh, you know, we'll have to negotiate that when we get to it. Um, and then there's almost the most, there's the most important aspect of memory. And this is where it all comes down to it. There are things in your past that have haunted you. Um, relationships that worry you. Events that changed you. And maybe not for the better. Uh, pains from the past that you are afraid to prod with your memory. And often I'm, when I meet people who say they don't remember much, it's this stuff they don't want to want to remember. And yet, what can you, if you want to get to the future, you're going to have to deal with this stuff. This stuff is like dogs chasing you down a, down a foggy trail on a mountain. And you can't see where you're going. You hear the dogs behind you. But in front, it's foggy. And you can't see where you're going. You can walk off the edge. Um, what do you do? Well, most people, what they do is they don't rec they know that there's something following them, these memories, things that have happened. And every now and then they'll hear the bark of the dog behind them and the growl, and they know the dogs are coming. And these are not friendly dogs. They're going to rip you to pieces when they find you. Um, and yet by the fact that you're constantly looking over your shoulder, you cannot see the future to make good choices. So all of your present moments are decided by your past. And this is so much the way we are tempted to live, to live in this kind of, you know, people who say, I don't want to think about my past. Well, those people are haunted by their do the dogs that are going to rip them to pieces. And what I've learned is this, the only way to deal with the past is by starting to open up your memory. And this, is, this goes way beyond what we can talk about here. But I'll give you a little hint. You have to open up your memory enough to feel that pain again. And some people say, well, that's way too much for me. And I can understand that. And it probably is. But in a sense, you'll never get into an open future where you can see again until you can stop and, in a sense, wait for the fog to clear. So what you have to do is turn around and look for those dogs because they're coming. Now, what we like to do is we like to fight. We want to hurt those dogs and kill them. The other thing we could do is we could uh, hide from them, you know, pick a good position. But of course, you can't see because you're in the fog. So what do we do? How's that? Uh, 
Um, you turn and you wait for the dogs to come. And you probably got some food with you. Pull it out. And when they get to you, give it to them. And or the, you know, the analogy breaks down here. But here's what you should do. You need to face the demons from your past. You need to face the memories. You need to face the relationships from the past. Because it's only by dealing with them and hiding and fighting won't work. It's only by forgiving those people. And what does that mean? Well, like I said, that's really important, but that's getting, getting a bit beyond uh, the parameters of this discussion on time. But forgiveness is the answer to the question. And forgiveness, the interesting thing about forgiveness is it takes those painful memories and it makes them less hot so that they aren't so violent in your mind. And in a sense, once you have repaired some relationship in the past, which is difficult, it then ceases to be the kind of thing that is so troubling. For me, I have done this, and I started doing this back when I started working on my memory in the, in the early 90s. And the thing I've learned since then is once you have found a darkness within you, and you have dealt with it, or at least begun to deal with it, Open that closet door from the past and leave it open. Open that drawer in that closet. Leave it open. Let the air breathe through. Allow the pain to come back and forth. Don't hide from it. And that is how you get to the present, to the future. Because suddenly you can say, oh, I would be tempted to do this. This is what I have done. Maybe there's another possibility. So you can get to some place by allowing even the darkest memories to find a way to find resolution. And it's not easy. And there are probably better people than me to talk to about this. But, but that is my solution. So it's not just to have memories, but it's to, to make a life that is memorable and to confront the memories that need to be confronting both the good and the bad. And the good are just as important because how do you get to the future if you don't have a way of understanding your good memories as well? And that's really important. You need to understand uh, what, you know, uh, you can't live in doubt. You have to live in trust. And in fact, this is really important. These, let me read this to you. This is from the Bible, from Paul's letter, first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 13, verse 13. He says, now these three remain, faith, hope, love. And the greatest of these is love. Well, faith, hope, and love are all found in time. Faith is about trust. Trust takes place in time based on knowledge, but it's not only it takes you beyond the knowledge. In a sense, it takes you into the future. But it is the anchor. It's what you trust. So that's why it's important to know the good things in your past so that you can trust, build something on something trustworthy, not on simply doubt. And there's a lot more to this that I, that I can say, but it's a good place to start. Next, love is about the present. You love people now. Now, you can love people in the past, but, but the point is you loved them then when it was the present. Love is how you deal with people now based on faith. People who You can't love someone not based on faith, at least faith that the, uh, people are worth loving. And finally, hope relates, of course, to the future. But hope is not just blind hope. It's not just uh, you know, a leap into the dark. Hope is based upon the things, the relationships that have been trustworthy. So my hope in God is not based upon, you know, some dogma. It's based upon my relationship to God over the years, in time. So we're going to end by listening to T.S. Eliot reading a little section from his poem, 
four quartets, and this is from number four, called Little Getting, and this is just a short section where he talks about the beginnings and the end, and this will be the end of our time series. I've, uh, you know, I'm sure I have not said everything I wanted to in this series, but, and it hasn't necessarily been organized as well as I might have. If I was writing a book, I would have organized this a lot more, and maybe someday I will. I'm still thinking about it, you see. And I'm using these videos as a way of thinking about it. And, and I was really, really, really happy to find out that Christopher Nolan's next movie, which is coming out next year, is called Tenet. And it's all about time. It's about uh, the end of time. And all sorts of interesting things. So, I, and in fact, uh, the clip that you saw uh, at the beginning, uh, it was from the, uh, the trailer for Christopher Nolan's Tenet. So, uh, but, but what is time? How do you live in time? How do you live in the unique relationship of everything around you? We are only just beginning to understand these things. We're nowhere near the uh, end of understanding these things. So to me, it essentially, all of science has to be reinterpreted scientifically, absolutely, with the scientific method and everything, but with the humility that all things are in a separate relationship to each other. How do we do that? I don't know. I'm not a scientist, but I do know we haven't arrived at some point. When somebody says to me, you know, science says X, I'm always like, yeah, right. <laughs> science hasn't finished doing anything. Science is just a method along the way. So maybe the, when people say, you know, you know, science has proved there is no God, it's not that science has proved there is no God, it's that we've been weighing and measuring things as if everything was only something in space and not time. As if everything was just a, an abstract slide, slide that you could put under the microscope. So anyway, we're going to let uh, T.S. Eliot have the last word from Four Quartets, my vote for the greatest poem of the 20th century. And uh, go look for, you can find it, him reading the whole thing somewhere on YouTube somewhere. Good luck finding it. If not, a uh, good way to do that is, uh, well, you know, the, the great thing about listening to him is it takes time. And uh, everything does. So it'll take time for you to even understand what I'm saying. Because right now, for a lot of you, this is like bubbling under in the top 40. You know, it's just like something that's, oh, what, what is Byrne talking about? Uh, maybe eventually people will grasp this more and start to change how they live in time. Uh, am I saying it's the greatest idea in the world? No, I'm just simply saying it's, it's like how people have lived. And we just need to live that way. Honest, truthfully. The anadromous life, living against the stream, living, but living in time. So we're just going to leave it here. I will see you again in the not too distant future. What we call the beginning is often the end. And to make an end is to make a beginning. The end is where we start from. And every phrase and sentence that is right, where every word is at home, taking its place to support the others, the word neither diffident nor ostentatious, an easy commerce of the old and the new, the common word exact without vulgarity, the formal word precise but not pedantic, the complete consort dancing together. Every phrase and every sentence is an end and a beginning, every poem an epitaph. And any action is a step to the block, to the fire, down the sea's throat, or to an illegible stone, and that is where we start. We die with the dying, see they depart and we go with them. We are born with the dead, See, they return and bring us with them. The moment of the rose and the moment of the yew tree are of equal duration. A people without history is not redeemed from time, for history is a pattern of timeless moments.
so, while the light fails on a winter's afternoon in a secluded chapel, history is now and England. A people, a people without, without history, history is not, not redeemed, redeemed from time. For history, For history is a pattern, is a pattern of timeless, timeless moments. moments. 